This is Stephen Hilda's last skydive. The straps on his parachute have been cut. He's falling 13,000 feet to his death. Everybody was in the frame to begin with. The forensic evidence is entirely consistent with suicide. He did not take his own life. He's dead and somebody did it. It was the end of a week-long skydiving competition. But for Stephen Hilda, the day's skydive will end in tragedy and spark a police investigation unique in British crime history. hadn't been brilliant through the week. We'd done a few lifts on the Wednesday, I think two, three lifts on the Wednesday, that was about it. Um, and the Friday had started off exactly the same as the, the rest of the week. Then early afternoon, it was apparent that we'd be able to get one jump in, so we started to prepare for that. This is footage filmed on the day of the competition. The three-man team are all officer cadets in the army and experienced skydivers who've each made over 200 jumps. Adrian Blair and David Mason are both 19 and Stephen Hilda is 20. On the minibus we were just laughing and joking around with one other team that was going to be jumping before us. Skydiving instructor Paul Hollow was in charge on the day. I have a list on the ground so I know who went in the plane and I know who I expect to come out the plane. At 13,000 feet, the competition starts when Paul gives the go-ahead. On the right to altitude, we were just focusing on what we were going to be doing on the jump, um, going over things in our head. Before getting out, we just gave each other sort of a handshake, a high five, sort of a good luck sign. I had given the aircraft a uh, clear drop, so a couple of minutes after that, the aircraft dispatched the parachutists. We climbed out of the plane and exited as a group. We started turning the different formations really fast was probably one of the best jumps we've done together. We all had eye contact, we had a big smile for each other, and because we knew we'd done really well on the jump. And at about 4,000 feet, we broke off. We got some horizontal separation so we could activate our own parachutes and clear our space. At this point, the cameraman loses sight of his fellow skydivers in the clouds. And then out of the corner of my eye, I saw some white material, which made me think that something was wrong. It was just sensory overload at the time. I didn't really register what was happening. On the ground, Paul was also puzzled. He could only see two of the team's parachutes, which are easy to spot because of their bright colours. He thought the last skydiver must have had a problem and used his white reserve parachute, which is harder to make out against the clouds. I dispatched uh, one of my instructors and a, uh, a volunteer to go and pick up what I thought was a, a parachutist who'd had a, a malfunction and was then landing underneath the reserve. I radioed out to them and said, um, has anybody seen the final canopy? Nobody had seen it, and yet everybody else had landed exactly where they were supposed to land. They asked me if I knew who it was, and I was able to tell them it was Steve because I recognised the distinctive colours of Dave's parachute 
and also Tim, our camera guy. So I knew that they were both okay and that it had to be Steve. One of the guys radioed in saying, I, I found it. So I said, you found what? He said, I found the reserve parachute. If the reserve parachute wasn't attached to a skydiver, then something had gone terribly wrong. They now knew they were searching for a body. We basically stood on the car, and the crops at the time were quite long. It was just before harvest time. So we saw an indentation in the crops. Myself and the other instructor, Tony, went to investigate. Seeing a body laying there, particularly under those circumstances, is not what I would wish on anybody. I was in shock, but when you skydive, you realise that it is such a high-risk activity sometimes that you do always prepare yourself for the, that the worst could happen. But this was no accident. I could not believe what I was seeing at the time. I, I hesitate to use the word sabotage, but there had been some kind of um, damage inflicted on that parachute before it had been used. Paul noticed that the straps on the parachute had been cut. He called the police. When I first got on the scene, I was told straight away that, it, that uh, the parachute had been deliberately cut, so the potential of, for murder was there immediately. Officers had never come across a case like this before. They took the unusual step of asking a skydiving expert to help collect evidence. The police asked my colleague and I to put some white coveralls on uh, and a mask and, and obviously some gloves. We then, under their instructions, took samples from parts of the equipment. Approximately an inch and a half of the webbing is what the police required as a sample. Officers started to search for other clues. We searched the bins, the roofs, and other parts of the site looking for knives or other sharp implements which could have caused the damage to Stephen's parachute. We inspected every piece of kit on site to make sure that nobody else has been tampered with, and unfortunately it hadn't been. The murderer could still have been at the scene if indeed this was a murder. So it was very important to get DNA from everybody at that scene and from anybody who'd been in contact with that parachute so we could compare the two. The police took DNA samples from everybody, uh, myself included. Um, so, yeah, I guess everybody was in the frame to begin with. Two of the most important witnesses that we had to see were, were, his, were his diving colleagues, David Mason and Adrian Blair. They'd seen him during the day, they'd seen his equipment, they'd been on the flight. Potentially, they could tell us an awful lot. Towards the end of the first interview I did on the day, I found out that the straps on Steve's parachute had been cut and that they were either looking at a suicide but more probably a murder investigation.